G'day, welcome to lesson two in our periodicity unit looking at the periodic table. In today's lesson, we are looking at the periodicity of chemical properties with specific reference to period three and its oxides. Our lesson objective is to describe reactions of period three elements with oxygen and water and investigate the periodicity of period three oxides. Learning outcomes will be addressing below. Following on from the last lesson, we introduced the idea that there's repeating patterns in the periodic table and we refer to this as periodicity. We focused specifically on the uh, physical properties. Today, we are now looking at the chemical properties and trends that we observe in chemical properties. Take us through today and the next lesson. There we go, so we look specifically at the period three elements, highlighting them as a case that we can then extrapolate to the rest of the periodic table. To remind you, periodicity is the repeating patterns and properties of the elements as you move across the periods of the periodic table. Now we can see similar trends in the chemical properties like what we did with the physical properties. And like I say, we can highlight this by looking specifically at our period three. Let's start by looking at the reactions that occur with oxygen and water. Looking at these, we need to consider, like we did with some of the physical properties of the um, period three elements, we need to consider what the type of bonding and what type of structure it has, because that will influence how it reacts chemically. We have, on the left-hand side, we have our metals. So we've got our sodium, magnesium, aluminium are our metallic structures on the left-hand side of the periodic table. Then we have the silicon, which is part of that metalloid staircase down the middle. And then we have the non-metals on the right-hand side. So they're gonna have certain bonding and structures uh, accordingly, where sodium, magnesium, aluminium, we see giant metallic structures, silicon, giant covalent, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, simple molecular, where argon's just monoatomic, just a single atom. So if we consider reactions with oxygen, we need to consider what these bonding models will mean for these types of reactions. Let's look at our metals. Sodium and magnesium will react violently with oxygen when heated to form sodium oxide and magnesium oxide. So we have a simple formation of an ionic compound where we have sodium, sodium metal, we are reacting that with oxygen gas and we will form this oxide of sodium, Na2O, where we've got to balance this to there for their solid over there. So we heat sodium up, it will react very violently with oxygen. We see the same thing with magnesium, where we have magnesium metal, we were to react that with oxygen gas. Again, heating that up would form magnesium oxide where we need to balance that like so. Looking from the sodium and then the next uh, one across is the magnesium, we see that the sodium reacts more vigorously with the magnesium and that makes sense if we think about it. Sodium only having that one valence electron shell, very reactive, really desperately wants to go get rid of that. Magnesium with two valence electrons similarly wants to get rid of it. However, it is more stable when compared to the sodium. So we see that periodicity between these. Aluminium similarly reacts with oxygen, burns bright uh, with oxygen when heated to also form aluminium oxide. So with our metallic structures going across the period, we see they do react with oxygen when heated and they become less vigorous as they go. Silicon is a little bit different. This is our giant covalent structure. This will react slowly with oxygen to form the macromolecular silicon four oxide structure, also called silicon dioxide. So we have a different bonding, a different structure. Consequently, we have different chemical properties that will relate to that when we react it with the oxygen. But it does react to form the macromolecular silicon dioxide. <laughs> then we have our simple molecular structures. Phosphorus and sulfur both react, albeit they react differently. Our phosphorus reacts vigorously, a yellow white flame is seen and it produces the phosphorus oxide compound there. Sulfur also burns gently, uh, also reacts, but it burns gently with the oxygen. We see a blue flame and we produce SO2 that can oxidize further to SO3. So both of these react, um, however, the phosphorus reacts more vigorously and the chlorine and argon don't react with oxygen directly at all. 
let's have a look at what these phosphorus and sulfur reactions would look like. In fact, if you wanna have a pause, give that a go. You know what the product is going to be. You know what you are reacting with it. Have a go at that and see if you get it when you check it now. If we have our phosphorus solid, we react that with oxygen. Like I said, reacts very vigorously. A yellow white flame is seen and we produce the phosphorus oxide, which is also in the solid form. If we want to balance this, we just need four of these and five of those, nothing too intense there. And then our oxides of sulfur can also react with oxygen less vigorously. A blue flame is observed though, which is quite cool. We get the solid sulfur reacting with our oxygen gas to form SO2, and then that can be oxidized further to form SO3. So if we have the SO2, the gaseous, that reacts with another mole of oxygen, we can go straight through to the sulfur trioxide like that. Need to balance this one. If we have two of those there, two of those there, that should be good. So some pretty straightforward reactions to start with. What's important here is knowing the observations in terms of flames that have produced colors of flames and the degree of vigorousness with which it reacts. But as far as the reactions go, nothing too strenuous at the moment. We also can see sodium and magnesium reacting with cold H2O. Sodium reacts very vigorously with um, water. If you put it on the water, you'll see it bouncing across the surface, moves as it converts into the molten metal. You get flames released and it leaves a strongly alkaline solution. Depending on how much you put in, you could even get a little bit of an explosion. It's quite a um, cool reaction and one definitely worth looking up to see. If we wanted to write an equation for this, why don't you pause, have a go. Sodium plus water to produce a alkaline solution. What would that look like? We would have the sodium metal reacting with the cold water and we would form sodium hydroxide so if you were to put an indicator in there that shows an alkaline solution, you would see it change color. And then we get hydrogen gas. Uh, that is effervesced. If we want to balance that, pop two of them there, two of them there, and we should be good. Magnesium also reacts with water, albeit much, much slower. It can take several days to react with cold water, whereas the sodium will react instantaneously. Again, showing that the reactivity decreases between the two. Leaves a weakly alkaline solution, which if we were to draw this one, we would have not the sodium metal, but rather the magnesium metal reacting with the cold water. And we would form the magnesium hydroxide and the hydrogen gas as well. Let me balance that, pop a two there, we should be good. However, you can speed up the reaction and see it react vigorously with steam. So if you have high temperature where you put the water in the gaseous state, you will get uh, steam and then you can react it to get magnesium oxide as opposed to magnesium hydroxide. So that would look like this. If we got magnesium solid and we react it with water in the gaseous state as opposed to the liquid state, we would form the magnesium oxide and then the hydrogen gas would be a byproduct. Let's have a look, all balanced, all balanced there. So a few characteristic reactions of our period three ones reacting with oxygen and we can see that periodicity depending on the type of bonding it contains and depending on where they are in relation to one another, we will see certain trends there. Moving along. Let's have a look at some of the periodicity we observe in these period three oxides themselves. First thing I want you to do is to have a pause and work out the oxidation number of each of the period three elements in this period three oxide. Have a go at that and then check your answer now. So what do we know? Thinking back to what we know about oxidation numbers. Our group one, our group two are always gonna be plus one, plus two respectively. 
Aluminium is going to be a plus three here if our oxygen is minus two. Two times minus, uh, three times minus two is minus six. That has to be plus three to make that a neutral compound. Silicon is going to be plus four here. Phosphorus is going to be plus five here. If we have minus two times 10, minus 20, four times plus five equals positive 20. You might be seeing a bit of a trend occurring. Sulfur, we had our sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. That's going to be plus four here. And that's going to be plus six here. Three times minus two is minus six. So that's going to be plus six. And then our chlorine, we can't react chlorine with oxygen directly, we said, but we can indirectly get an oxide of chlorine. That is going to be a plus seven over here. You might see a pretty obvious trend in the oxidation number of the period three oxides. What we see is they are all positive and we see a rise in the oxidation number as we move from left to right across the period. We can justify this as oxygen is going to be more electronegative than any of these atoms. So therefore they're all gonna be positive and each uh, period three element can use all its outer shell electrons. So we see that increase as they get more of them. Here's two questions I want you to do. Again, writing some chemical equations showing the reactions this time of the oxides of our period threes. First question, oxides of sodium and magnesium react with water to form a strongly alkaline and a weakly alkaline solution respectively. Write equations that show this. So you're given the oxides there, you've told what it's reacting with and some characteristics about the products. Can you write two reactions for those two there? And then secondly, magnesium oxide and magnesium hydroxide are used to remedy indigestion. Write a reaction of both uh, with hydrochloric acid to show how they could neutralize stomach acid. Have a go at writing those two reactions. Again, you're given the oxides at the top here, you're given the reactants, you're given some information about the products, give that a go, and I will reveal the answer now. So our oxides of sodium and magnesium are Na2O and MgO respectively. If we're reacting them with water and we're forming a strongly alkali for the sodium, thus sodium hydroxide, weakly alkali for the magnesium, thus the magnesium hydroxide, those reactions would look like that respectively. We can show magnesium oxide and magnesium hydroxide acting as a base by reacting with an acid to neutralize. Magnesium oxide reacting with hydrochloric acid to form the magnesium chloride and the magnesium hydroxide reacting with the hydrochloric acid to form the magnesium chloride. So they can uh, neutralize the stomach acids and help to remedy some indigestion. So they got some uses there. So we see some periodicity in the oxidation number and some reactions with water and acids respectively. Aluminium does not react or dissolve easily in water, but it can act as an amphoteric substance. Amphoteric is a word that we might not have seen for quite a while. It means it can act both as an acid and as a base. If you think of amphibian, amphibians can live both on land and water. Amphoteric substance can act both as an acid and as a base. So whereas over here we have our group one and two oxides, just reacting, uh, reacting as a base here to form alkaline substances up here and then neutralizations down there, our aluminium oxide can act as an amphoteric. So we can see it reacting with an acid. If we can define a base as something that neutralizes an acid, we can see that here, we've got sulfuric acid and we form a salt and we have a neutralization reaction. Similarly, we can see it reacting with an alkali if it's hot and concentrated where we have the aluminium oxide but it's neutralizing the base this time to form the ionic salt. So we might be beginning to see a bit of a trend in terms of the acidity and alkalinity of our period three oxides. We've got a couple of acidic, uh, sorry, pardon me, a couple of um, basic alkali substances. We've got an amphoteric. You might be able to predict what direction we're going for the covalent ones coming up. So let's have a look here what we see when we investigate the properties of our covalent period three oxides as opposed to our uh, metallic ones. Due to the macromolecular giant covalent structure, silicon dioxide is insoluble. If we think back to what we said last lesson about those macromolecular structures, very strong covalent bonds, difficult to break. Therefore, we can't um, dissolve silicon dioxide in water, but we can act as an acid uh, and react and dissolve with an alkali. For example, here we have our um, base and we can see that our silicon dioxide is acting as an acid to react with the base. 
Let's have a look at phosphorus and sulfur. Both act as an acid. They react vigorously with water to accept the hydrogen and form strongly acidic solutions. Instead of me giving you this reaction, why don't you have a pause and see if you can write some reactions to show our phosphorus and sulfur acting as acids. Given the oxides of phosphorus and sulfur, in the table above, can you write a reaction of each with water to show the formation of an acidic solution? Can you potentially name the products? Pause now, see if you can write three reactions to show the phosphorus and sulfur oxides acting as acidic substances. And I will give you the reactions here. So <clears throat> we've got the oxide of phosphorus, P4O10. Um, if we show it reacting with water, then we can show that we form a substance here where we get a phosphoric acid. Similarly, we can show the SO2 plus the H2O forming sulfurous acid and the SO3 plus H2O forming sulfuric acid. So we can get phosphorus and sulfur oxides forming acidic solutions. So if we wanna summarize all of those points and put them neatly in a table together, we can explain the acidic, basic, or amphoteric nature of our period three oxides based on their bonding and the structure. Here are our period three elements. Here are the bonding that we've looked at in the last video as well as this one. So we have giant metallic, giant metallic, giant metallic, giant covalent, and then our simple molecular. What we saw with the oxides is we start off with basic oxides, sodium oxide and magnesium oxide forming hydroxides in solution. Our aluminium oxide can be amphoteric. We saw that neutralizing either an acid or a base. And then we saw our covalent ones all acting as acidic by reacting with alkalis or forming acidic solutions. So we can see a little bit of a trend going from the left to right. We see the um, oxides of our period threes going from basic to amphoteric to acidic. Just to finish off today, looking at something a little bit left of center, but it's something that we need to discuss, so better here than anywhere else, is this idea of ceramics. Ceramics you might be familiar with. They're inorganic, non-metallic materials that are often crystalline oxides. You can see while we're putting it in here whilst we're talking about our oxides. They have certain properties that make them useful for certain tasks. They're strong, they're brittle, they're hard, they have high melting points, and they are electrical insulators. So we can see some of our period three oxides that have uses that take advantage of these uh, properties that these ceramics have. For example, we have our aluminium oxide, our silicon dioxide to make ceramics for tiles, cookware, bricks, lots and lots of uses that we can use ceramics for. And we see our magnesium oxides can line the inside of furnaces, taking advantage of that very high melting point that they have. And that concludes our second lesson where we've been looking at the periodicity of the chemical properties, specifically with reference to the oxides. What have we done? We've described the reactions, if any, of the elements with oxygen. We haven't discussed the reactions with chlorine. That is going to be our focus of our next lesson, but we did look at the reactions with water for sodium and magnesium. We've stated and explained the variation in oxidation number of the oxides and chlorides. Again, we haven't looked at the chlorides. That will be in the next lesson. In terms of the outer shell electrons, we've described the reactions of the oxides with water, described and explained the acid-base behavior of oxides and hydroxides, including where relevant amphoteric behavior and reactions with acids and bases, interpret the variations and trends in terms of bonding and electronegativity, suggested the types of chemical bonding present in chlorides, haven't looked at chlorides, we'll look at that next lesson, and oxides from observations of their chemical and physical properties. And then just at the end there, we did that little aside looking at our ceramics, explain the strength, high melting point, electrical insulating properties of ceramics in terms of their giant structure. Excellent. Tasks for this lesson. Pause now, work from the bottom up to the top, one column at a time. Thank you as always. I will see you on the next one as we conclude our first unit in inorganic chemistry and we conclude the periodicity topic.